This is it. We're finally going to review Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn as an entire trilogy. I already did book one. If you want to check that out, go ahead and uh, hit up the channel. I'll probably put a card up here somewhere and you can hear what I had to say about book one and kind of an intro to the series. I also have a Lands of Ostinard. It's kind of a before you read to set the scene for Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn. I'm not going to try to rehash too much of what I did in those two videos and this is going to be more uh, about books two, A Stone of Farewell, and book three which is Two Green Angel Tower and I'm going to try to just kind of round out the series and give my thoughts and opinions on it as a whole uh, as a piece of just amazing fantasy. So as you know, I was huge on uh, Dragonbone Chair and I kind of addressed a lot of the pacing issues that people have with the Dragonbone Chair and I'm here to tell you that if uh, book one didn't tickle your fancy, if it was a little too slow, I think Stone of Farewell and specifically Two Green Angel Tower improve on the pace uh, tenfold and you also have had time now to get more invested in the characters. One of the biggest changes from Dragonbone Chair to Stone of Farewell and then the third entry as well is the fact that we get 90% of the story through Simon's POV in book one. And I know that some people don't love Simon. It's good to know, and I think I noted this maybe one time before, but it's good to know that Stone of Farewell and Two Green Age Tower actually have plenty more POVs. It feels a little bit more uh, familiar to the other series that we know and love, like A Song of Ice and Fire and such and you just get more POVs and the story really broadens out and becomes a lot more encompassing throughout the whole world, which I love, obviously, I made an entire video on the lands of Ostenard, and it, it helps the story move along at a better pace. And really, when I think about the POVs and how it gets spread out, I know Simon can be grading for some. I actually really like Simon. I think he's one of the most realistic teenagers <laughs> written in fantasy for better or for worse, and I really felt as if the POVs were all solid. I didn't have anybody that I was reading uh, that bored me. Um, and when one would kind of slack off, the others would pick up. So that's where I thought Tad really improved the pacing. Uh, though I did have some critiques towards the end of book three, which I'll get to in just a little bit. And uh, I, I kind of ranted about the world building before in other videos, but I do want to say that I feel like book two and three really get the most mileage out of the world building that is set up that kind of kills the pace in book one a little bit. Uh, like, for instance, the multiple languages that are spoken. There's actually a lot of miscommunication or not direct transfers uh, or translations for certain things said in other languages. And, like, I really like that because so often it's just, like, taken for granted that there wouldn't be a miscommunication or anything like that whenever two people of two different dialects are speaking. But Tad, like, explores that. And just the way, like, Benebeck kind of speaks, like, broken Erkenlandish is just... A nice touch to his character. Uh, also, want to note, and I didn't say this before, but my God, this audiobook is phenomenal. I think book one you probably want to read in paper because there's a lot of hard names. But the uh, gentleman who did the narration on Audible did a bang up job. I mean, one of the best audiobooks that I've listened to in the last two or three years, I think. And just going back really quick to the the language barrier thing with Tad. He uses it as a device to like further explain things that you may not understand because of the language barrier. People have to spell it out in like plain, for lack of a better term, English or whatever. And it actually takes him a time without having to go into his long exposition to explain to the reader something that might be important later on. So it's like a really neat plot device and it's one of the more masterful pieces of Tad's writing. Uh, speaking of giving information to the reader, Tad is very careful to never insult the reader's intelligence. And a lot of it comes within the planning. So a large amount of book two is like people coming together, okay? After book one, uh, we have people that have never met each other, but we also have people who get split up. Well, book two is all about coming, well, to the Stone of Farewell, uh, spoiler alert for the, the title of the book. And they're all coming together. And during these planning phases and these conversations, uh, stuff will come up in the plot or stuff that has already existed in the plot that we know of that I'll be sitting there and saying, that doesn't make much sense. Why don't they just do this? Or they're talking about doing something or they are doing something. And I'm like, that doesn't make any sense. Why would they do that? Uh, or that's not going to work. And Tad's like really careful to not insult you in that manner because he will actually call out plot holes with the characters. So they're designed to be there as conflicts for them to overcome. And it also then validates you as a reader, like, hey, I knew that. I knew that wasn't going to work. I knew Benebeck was on something weird. And as a whole, I think Tad handles conflict uh, extraordinarily well. And it might be one of the strongest pieces of his writing 
uh, along with his world building and character and pro all the good stuff with Tad. I mean, if you know, you, you guys know, I think he's probably the best fantasy writer um, ever uh, that I've read. I'm excited to see how Hob stacks up. I've heard she's excellent, and I I believe it. Anyways. I do think the way that Tad handles conflict throughout the story, even on a micro scale with conversation and planning and how people do not get along, especially when they're, you know, from all different regions and they all have a different idea of how to handle these things all the way to the macro with the war and the action is just really well done. And Tad gets across the conflict from different points of views, uh, which he, you know, utilized with the bigger cast here in book two and three and just is able to give the reader a lot of stock in the story with uh, us making decisions in our head and him backing them up or questioning them. And uh, I've been heaping praise upon Tad um, time and time again. So I just want to read like a piece of book three that I just found to be kind of amazing and a good example and excerpt of the story to kind of highlight some of the really good writing, but just the overall like feel and tone of the story. Had to pull the big boy off the shelf to, to read this. Below the forge, but also inside Simon, a sua stirred. The crumbled stone shivered and bloomed anew, gleaming like the walls of heaven. Whispering shadows became gold night, laughing ghost. Ghost becomes Sithy, hot with life. Music as delicately beautiful as dew spot spiderweb stretched through the resurrected halls. A great red streak climbed into the sky above Green Angel Tower. The heavens surrounded it, but the other stars seemed only timid witnesses and a great storm rolled out of the north, a whirling blackness that vomited wind, lightning, and turned everything beneath it to ice, leaving only dead, silent whiteness in its wake. Like a man floundering in a whirlpool, Simon felt himself at the center of powerful currents with no strength to alter them. He was a prisoner of the wheel. The world was turning toward something mighty. A calamitous change, but Simon could not even lift his hand to his burning face. I try to do some dramatic reading there. Maybe not the best. I'm not a great uh, reader. I will never, <laughs> I will never narrate an audiobook. I'm sure. Uh, but it, when you re- listen to that, it, it just it's so eloquent. It's so well put. It's almost lyrical, and the imagery is outstanding. Uh, and I don't know. It stood out to me. I highlighted it, and I just kind of wanted to read it because I think it kind of sets the tone for the third book, and it's it's excellent. Now I've been heaping praise, 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 praise. I do have three cons uh, or just small critiques that that I felt, and maybe they're just personal. They're all subjective. Everything's subjective. But uh, the miscommunication between Miriam L. and Simon uh, with the does she or doesn't she and doesn't he, doesn't he, blah, 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 it did get a bit annoying at times. But again, these are young people. It, It might even be realistic for the communication to go like that. But it did get a bit grating at times. And I also felt like the pacing with Simon towards the end of book three, um, where he's going through like, you know, without spoilers, kind of a deep, dark place. I felt like it went on just a little too much and we could have pivoted over to different POVs and then had him be further through that journey. Uh, the book's 520,000 words, one of the longest fantasy books ever written. And I actually think like most of it's justified. I think the length of it is perfectly fine with the way that the story wraps up. However, I did feel like it was dragging a bit to where I was kind of like, okay, let's get let's get him out of this situation to the next portion of his journey or his plot or whatever. And the final thing here is just me, but I did find that the least engaging portions of the book were actually combat, but I, I feel that way a lot, unless if someone writes combat like super fluently and just, you know, to a T, which like John Gwen, I think Evan Winter also does a great job, uh, but that's not really the sole purpose here in, uh, in Memory Star with Thorne is a part of the story to get... Uh, you know, points across, but it's not like the focal point. And that's fine. Uh, I just didn't think the combat was super engaging. It's not terrible by any means. And the ending, uh, how did the ending go? Uh, well, it went it went damn near perfect. In fact, I think some people might think it might have been a little bit too perfect, but not me. I, it kind of feels like a precursor to what we see with Sanderson with his plots where we have all these moving parts. Like imagine you have shoelaces laid out all over the floor and you have to figure out, they're all tied in knots and you have to figure out where they all link to at the end and how they're all connected. Uh, and just thinking about that gives me anxiety, by the way. <laughs> I don't know how these 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 writers do it uh, and Sanderson especially, but Tad, what he did here, there's so many moving parts, there's pieces of history, there's lore, there's all this stuff. And it has to all come together at the end and make sense and be digestible. And one of the things I mentioned earlier is that he's very careful to never insult the reader. And that was never more true than with the ending. There were some really big surprises that I did not see coming that I thought were really cool. 
And they could have came across cheesy or maybe just, um, you know, a little hokey, but that it, it didn't. It didn't didn't happen. And that's kind of been the theme throughout Memory, Sorrow, and Thorn in my experience is that things that other people, if they wrote it, might seem cheesy, Tad kills it. And he just makes it super enjoyable. And it's stuff that will stick with me for a very long time. So do, do I think Memory, Sorrow, Thorn is worth it in 2021 or, or thereafter? Yeah, I do. I, I think this is an excellent series. I think it's an important series. It's one of the best fantasy series I've ever read. This trilogy is tremendous. I'm going to read Last King of Osnard. I am going to wait till book three is out so I can just read them all in succession. So that'll probably be around the fall. This is something that I will more than likely reread, especially after I get through Last King of Osnard. I could see maybe in a year or two coming back because there's a lot to chew on here with this much content uh, in the side of the books. There's a lot to dive deep on. I'm thinking about doing maybe a Characters of Ostenard video, so if you'd like to see that, let me know down in the comments. That'd be really cool. And uh, if you're still, you know, if maybe if you got sold, you finally watched this, you watched the whole trilogy review, say, all right, I'm in. Uh, you can check out the Lands of Ostenard here on the channel. I think it's a really good primer to get you kind of acquainted with the map and the cultures. Uh, and it's just, it's a little snack just before you dive in. It makes things a little bit easier to digest, I hope. And uh, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure to read this series. I love when I find something that just blows my socks off and lives up to the hype that I built up to it in my head with it being a huge inspiration for A Song of Ice and Fire, which is my favorite series of all time. I know that's not cool anymore, but it, it is, it is, sorry. I, I like I like his writing, whatever. Uh, but it being a huge influence on that, this had a lot of hype. And for me, it lived up to the hype and actually, it, it gave me a new appreciation uh, for just that transition from classical to modern fantasy and where Tad plays into the entire landscape of the fantasy genre. I think he should be mentioned with the names like Tolkien uh, and Ursula. I think Tad Williams belongs in that conversation and I can't wait to read more of his works coming up. So thank you so much for spending your time with me and watching this review and I hope you enjoyed some of my dramatic reading and if there's any certain things you'd like to see with the lore from Memory Star and Thor let me know. I'm, I'm definitely interested in making more content for Ostenard and uh, again, I will be getting to the sequel trilogy sometime later this year. So thank you so much. If you'd like to see more Ostenard stuff, more Tad Williams stuff, go ahead and like and subscribe. And you can turn on the little bell if you'd like to get notifications. And I hope you're doing well and you're healthy. And until next time, remember to always keep turning the page. Mm -hmm.